we are very lucky to have Jeff Hirsch speak to us today. He's the CEO of the Hirsch Holdings and editor of the stock market Al Almanac. He's spoken to us before, very knowledgeable about, about the subject he covers. And uh, the title of his first presentation is Understanding Market History, What I Have Learned from the Past. His second presentation will talk about applying it to today's market, today's situations. Uh, Jeff is CEO of First Hold, Editor-in-Chief of Stock Market Almanac and Publisher of Almanac Investors at uh, www.stocktradersalmanac.com. Jeff is author, for, author of The Little Book of Stock Market Cycles and The Super Boom, Why the Dow Will Hit 3,320 and How You Can Profit from It. He works at the Yale, at the, he works with Yale, with founder Yale Hirsch for 20 years, taking over in 2001. He has 30 years of Wall Street experience. He appears on regularly on CNBC, Fox Business, and Bloomberg, and many other financial media. Now in his 57th year, the stock market almanac has been published since 1968. I'm looking forward to this presentation. So Jeff, uh, you have the forum and, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks everyone for joining me for this presentation. Um, you know, since I'm doing both segments, there's there's a lot of stuff to cover here, um, um, but admittedly, I'm not gonna get to everything that's within the Almanac and, and everything that I've learned but um, the, there will be a little bit of, of applied wisdom in the, the history, and there will be a little history in the applied wisdom because they kind of run together. Um, so basically, um, let, let's get started. Um, One more thing I want to throw in, uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Because of the crowd, uh, please type in your questions on chat, and they will then we'll get them as... as uh, as Jeff uh, asks for questions, and uh, that way we can get through the questions, and then we'll anything left over we'll do at the end of the presentation. Um, exactly. So um, let's you know I'll take questions to clarify things along the way, but we don't want it to bog us down. So um, let's just um, you know make sure that uh, we don't take too many and and, and slow down the, the the process here, but. Um, just a little history. Um, you know, I was sort of born, bred, weaned, raised on stock market patterns, cycles, and seasonality. Um, my father, Yale Hirsch, started the Stock Traders Almanac in 1966 is when he incorporated and began the study and diligent um, preparation for his iconic work. Uh, he had been working at a place called Indicator Digest out of Palisades Park, New Jersey, for his first cousin, my godfather, Sam Coslow, Samson Coslow, who I named my first child after, um, who was a songwriter and a, a movie producer and had gotten burned in the market back uh, during the old crash and was a student of the market. Ran a, a pretty cool ad in Barron's in the old days and um, it hit and Yale was working in the music industry with him and on his own and called up my father and said, Yellow want you to run operations. And it ended up being a proving grounds for newsletter writers and market analysts. Uh, a lot of people you, you may have heard of uh, came through those, those turnstiles over the years. Um, so here's a look at the uh, a bunch of the books and the places that we get to appear. And one of the things that we're most proud of is that the Stock Traders Almanac, not only is it useful and, and, and you know, perfect for, um, novices and retail investors and people just learning and people who are seasoned investors but it's been on the desk of top money managers and institutions for the whole you know the whole history back 57 years so here's the initial 68 edition as a little uh, uh inscription um from my parents sent to i think it was a friend of ours who sent it back to us the current or the upcoming 24 almanac uh kind of a new fun cover we have going there we are going to be doing the Commodity Traders Almanac for 2024. We're working on that right now. That should be out within uh, time to get it by the end of the year. Um, 
my uh, Almanac Investor book, which came out, I believe it was a way of memory serves. There's a lot of seasonal sector trading and it still gets gets reprinted and, and, and ordered. Um, and Don't Sell Stocks on Monday was Yale's famous book. I've got a slide talking about this. That was uh, just a fantastic title in line. And that came out and I believe it was 89 and there was a paperback in 90 or 92. And the super boom book that, that, Lynn and, and the forecast that Lynn mentioned was a forecast I made in 2010, which I'm going to go through into detail, but it's based upon something Yale discovered back in 76. And we'll talk, talk about that a little book of stock market cycles. Uh, one of those wily little books. It's kind of a sophisticated book for dummies on, you know, sort of a whole four year cycle, you know, whereas the almanacs focused on the actual year of the four year cycle, 24 being an election year edition. The little book covers them all. Uh, and it's really approachable. And of course, some of the places that uh, we are proud to have uh, to get quoted and appear in. A little picture of me with the legend uh, back when I had a little bit more hair. This is back at our old office in Old Japan. Um, Yale passed away at the ripe old age of 98 uh, back in 2001, just after his, you know, about a month or so after his 98th birthday, which we did get to celebrate with him. Um, so I've got a little longevity uh, in the blood, in, in the genes. So we've got that going for me. And one of our, you know, uh, you know, just privileges and, and honors was when Yale was, uh, he was on Wall Street Week twice. Here's a great picture with uh, Rue Kaiser there in the middle. Um, and uh, just, you can see the old 70s mustache over here. So just a little, little trip down memory lane. Um, my trading philosophy is is sort of a, a a flip on the old Santiana quote that those who fail to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I like to say that those who understand market history are bound to profit from it. Just a few of the keys to market cycles, uh, maybe a little obvious, but sometimes you know you want to make sure you the obvious is not uh, overlooked. Um, you want to identify the seasonality of the cycle or pattern and then anticipate and analyze the setup. Sometimes things don't set up perfectly. Uh, this this year in this cycle, for example, the four year cycle is is uh, really tra we're tracking very, very, very closely to that. And we'll, we'll see some charts on that. We look for technical and fundamental alignment. I know there's often a battle between technical analysis and fundamental analysis, which one's right or wrong. I like them both. I overlay with my seasonal patterns. And uh, we also look at um, other things in a second, I'll tell you. We execute with um, technical indicators, and you got to use some discipline. You stick with what works and check your emotions at the door. Uh, the disciplines that I look at are our foundation, you know, the five disciplines here. The first one, the foundation is seasonality, cycles, patterns, trends. Um, we look at the economy um, and what's going on currently with, with, uh, uh, economic readings and, and what's going on overseas, uh, geopolitically and, and otherwise. We look at monetary and government policy, as well as market internals and sentiment, uh, put call ratios. Um, I, I love the um, investors' intelligence, which I have a chart on later, uh, new highs and new lows, market breadth, uh, and then, of course, fundamentals and technical analysis. One of the first things that Yale taught me when we were you know, picking stocks back in the day, we, we still do. We use a fundamental screen now, which I'll, I'll describe shortly, but was the the price to sales ratio, looking for small stocks and, and under discovered stocks that were um, trading or below a, a one, a, a price to sales ratio of one, price to sales being something that's uh, not easily manipulated by CFOs and, and, and uh, financial accounting, financial, you know, creative accounting. And of course, technical analysis. I'm currently uh, going for my CMT. I've passed the first level and I'm looking to get the uh, full credential sometime in the next year or so. The major cycles that um, we track, uh, war and peace and the markets. This drives secular bull and bear markets and that super boom cycle that we're gonna look at in just a second. The decennial pattern, um, which we've incorporated into um, our stock traders almanac aggregate cycle, you'll see in a few charts in a bit. One of the the big um, 
you know, we're not huge proponents of the decennial cycle, lean more on the four year and the seasonals, but there's some patterns uh, like the fifth year being the best year with the Dow up um, uh, 12 and down two with a 26.1% average. And of course, the four year presidential election stock market cycle is something that has been a huge proponent of the Stock Traders Almanac for years, something that we've been the champion of uh, probably more than anybody. Our seasonal cycles, the best six months, November to April, you all know about sell in May and go away. Well, we like to say buy in October and uh, get your portfolio sober. And we kind of um, don't just sell in May and go away willy nilly. We, we reposition in May. And of course, we'll get into the details of that shortly. Um, sectors and commodity seasonal cycles, we, we incorporate into our um, uh, uh, trading, you know, positions or investment recommendations and, you know, a good look at the quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily and intraday trading patterns and the January indicators, the January barometer, which Yale invented back in 72, along with the Santa Claus rally, which I'll explain. And um, we'll touch on some of this stuff um, as, as we move through the program. Though, admittedly, I won't be able to get to everything. There's a lot. And I and I, I have a lot in here anyway. So um, let's look at the secular market cycle and the 500% moves that Yale discovered following inflation that we, you know, built on and, and um, you know, added to and uh, expanded on um, back after we had the last uh, uh, major secular low. This is a chart that Yale put together back in 1976. You can see it's from a special report that was put out in January 77. It had, the special report contained a few articles that were in the Smart Money newsletter that we had published at the time. Um, now we've consolidated all that stuff into what we call Almanac Investor Newsletter. So this has got some hand drawings on it. Um, this is from an old um, uh, uh, transparency that used to put on the overhead projector is also printed in the newsletter. You can see these secular bear markets surrounding the major wars of, of the, the 20th century with World War I, World War II, and the Great End of the Depression, and then Vietnam. And you can see the CPI rising due to uh, military spending and other government spending, uh, again, here at the um, in World War II, and also through the um, you know, rough, rough years of the 70s there with the oil embargo and that sort of thing. And then the Dow rising 500% from each, uh, you know, secular um, bear low. And the prediction back then, which I didn't put the t-shirt in here, but back when Yale had a conference in, um, it was the early 80s, uh, 1980, I believe, over here in Tarrytown across the river from, from, uh, where I live now in Nyack, and he had this, his forecast was Dow 3420, which clearly rhymes with Dow 38820, which we'll talk about uh, you know, more in a second. Um, so we had these t-shirts made up. I still have a box of them. Um, they're all medium, so I'm not really fitting into one of those. But um, around the time of um, the, uh, you know, great, uh, GFC, the great financial crisis and the 09 bottom, uh, and even leading up to that, when we had that 02 low and, and when, you know, the whole build up to going into Iraq in 03 and after the Gulf War, uh, in, in, uh, excuse me, after, you know, 9 11, um, this whole pattern became apparent to us again. And, um, admittedly, inflation didn't perform, as you can see here, as, as um, on cue as it did for the last one, but it's come back in, in spades here recently. Then we've, we've all seen that. We've added, uh, um, you know, some key points uh, to the to the secular uh, boom cycle, the super boom cycle. There are there are several uh, uh, there are cycles out there that people point to the 17 and a half year, the 18 year cycle. We're more um, oriented towards events that trigger these cycle, and we've highlighted them in this chart. Um, I think uh, our friend Josh Brown called this one of the greatest charts he's ever seen. A lot of people are, are emulating it now and have used it. But, uh, you know, the secular cycle started World War I with the, the Archduke being assassinated and ended with the armistice signing in 1918. Uh, World War II, um, after the crash, of course, the secular cycle here, um, 
Germany invading um, Poland and then Japan surrendering. Uh, you can see five hundred percent move through the Roaring Twenties, but a shorter um, secular bear cycle and a shorter secular bull cycle. Um, this secular bear, you could argue, goes back further, but this is the bulk of it. Um, a pretty, a, a little bit longer period from forty nine to say, you know, sixty eight or, or seventy three, depending upon where you want to put that that, that peak. Um, and then, you know, a bit of a longer uh, secular bear cycle. This is sort of that, you know, uh, 1982 low that everyone uh, has agreed to, um, even though uh, this, you know, here's the 74 low right here. Um, even though folks want to say the secular uh, bull market started at the bottom in 09, we contend that it started probably around 2016 or even, you know, 2013, depending upon where you want to. Um, put your level, one of those smaller cyclical bear markets. But here you had the Dow with the advent of the information revolution and the microprocessor and, and all these things. And part of the super boom equation is you've got war, inflation, and then something that we've dubbed a, it's a bit of a mouthful, a culturally enabling paradigm shifting technology. Um, as I just alluded to here, the microprocessor, the internet, uh, and all this technology, the things that could be happening now with AI and biotech, that, that may be part of the, the um, you know, culturally enabling technologies that affect everybody individually and the whole planet collectively. Things like, you know, the combustion engine, uh, indoor plumbing way back, um, the industrial revolution type of stuff, train travel, air travel, uh, you know, refrigeration, air conditioning, all those kinds of technologies that really changed the world. Um, so what we had this particular cycle is we had the the event, um, you know, with when we were attacked on 9-11 and the war on terror that continued official combat, um, you know, ended in Afghanistan, though it did drag on for a while. And uh, um, I'm going to jump ahead. So so to, to the next chart here, when we put the book out, Super Boom, um, you know how the Dow is going to go from thirty from to thirty eight thousand, a five hundred percent move by the year twenty twenty five. We did this chart for sort of you know promotion for for Amazon for our publisher Wiley, and um, basically the math that Yale did back in seventy six was from the the intraday low of the Dow back in seventy four. Memory serves, I think it was six seventy. You multiply that by six, you get thirty four twenty. We had the um, intraday low of I think it was sixty four seventy. You can check check up my memory service from uh, March sixth of '09, the day before the closing bottom. Time six gets you thirty eight thousand eight twenty. And I made this forecast back in May of twenty ten with the Dow at about ten thousand. And when we put the book out, uh, first of all, I, I put it in the stock traders almanac. It was in our newsletter in May, but it was in the Stock Traders Almanac, the 2011 edition. And then we did the Super Boom book, which came out um, in spring of 2011, too, if, if memory serves. So um, I put this, uh, yeah, you can see the, the blue line forecast I made here um, starting in the, in the spring of 2011. So the publisher asked me to put together a projection of what I envisioned using my, you know, you know, what I've learned from the past uh, and looking forward like we do every year, but even further out using the four-year cycle, the seasonal patterns, some of the, the you know, activities, the politics that were going on on the ground. And I drew this blue line, uh, closing prices for the Dow. And I've made some adjustments to it over the years, but I've gone back to the original um, and it's uh, uncanny to me how some of it actually played out and how powerful the cycles are uh, over time. No one could have predicted we were going to get COVID uh, here in 2020, but uh, I had, um, you know, a bear market there uh, lined up. You can see this move from the midterm low in 2018 to um, the, the um, pre-election year high at the end of the year. That shows up. Um and with all of the, the cash infusion that um, all of the government spending and all of the, the QE, it seems to have, um, and even though some of that's coming back to, to roost right now and we're, we're, we're trying to work that off, 
Uh, it seems to us that the the this forecast for 38 820 is way ahead of schedule. Um, so this is as of the end of July, you know, August kind of went sideways, you know that. But, uh, from my vantage point, it looks like we're probably, you know, either going to get to 38,000 or up above 35 now or thereabouts, um, either towards the end of 2024 or right on schedule in 2025. After that, which, you know, I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a clue. I'm thinking we might end up, and I'm just going to go back a slide. We might end up going through one of the more sideways periods. I'm not sure it's going to be as, as uh, um, rough as it was in the, in the 70s and 80s, but I would contend that we might be entering a more, um, this is after 2024 into 2025, maybe even beyond that, more of a stock pickers, seasonal trading, um, you know, and, and just traders market kind of sideways secular market um, on the horizon in a couple of years. So that's the super boom forecast, the long term, the long game, and um, it's ahead of schedule. And all of the, you know, the observations that Yale made back in the 70s and the, the wisdom and knowledge of the four year cycle and seasonalities enabled us to, to um, you know, enabled me to make this projection that seems to be coming home, co coming, coming true right now. So let's just switch into the four-year cycle. And, um, you know, we were bearish last year. I don't have a whole host of things on the, uh, the you know, our outlooks and forecasts from 22, but you can go back and check it at, at our website, stocktradersalmanac.com. We came into the year, you know, back in, in, you know, the end of 21 and early 22 with, you know, concern about heightened volatility with the midterm year, especially after running up so much. And, you um, knowing that the midterm year is usually where most bear markets occur and bottom. Um, and this chart, four-year cycle chart, simple bar chart, shows the, the gains um, you know, in, the, in each of the four years. The third year of the cycle, when presidents are priming the pump to be reelected or have their party reelected, has averaged 16.8%. Um, midterm year is the weakest. Uh, a lot of bear markets bottom, a lot of them bottom in October. Um, Post-election years have been a bit better when new presidents come in and try to, to um, you know, make things better right away. Election years after a couple of rough ones in 2000 with the undecided election and then 08 with the, uh, you know, secular bear market really, you know, hitting its, uh, you know, its peak and the great and the financial crisis. Um, election years have been stronger again. And I'll, you'll see uh, uh, as I get towards the end also that uh, the power of a sitting president running for re-election is pretty strong. So that's the four-year cycle in a nutshell. And this is one of the main drivers um, of our longer-term analysis. And luckily for us, this cycle um, is tracking very closely to these patterns. Everyone likes to think or talk about um, Republicans being better for the stock market. Uh, Republican presidents. It's not really the case. Um, Congress holds the purse string, the purse strings, and um, you know, as we've seen with this, you know, uh, government shutdown threats here and there, and and you know, all of, of you know that sort of back and forth with the parties and 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 the and the two branches. Um, Congress does have a bit of power when it comes to spending, and we see a shift usually every midterm year where the incumbent president loses seats in the House. And what happened this time around, um, Republicans didn't get both houses of Congress, but they did get the House back. And we saw what happened in the spring with, with the, the jockeying for position there. Um, both uh, McCarthy and Biden did some, some you know, tactful, you know, tactical moves. And I think uh, Mr. Biden, um, you know, being a, a seasoned Congress a senator w was able to um, uh, appease the the you know Republicans and and put off some of that stuff for a while, and, and that's part of the whole pre-election year, you know, priming the pump action. But the best combination in the green bar is a Democratic president and Republican Congress. Um, it happened with the combination of uh, um, you know uh, Bill Clinton and. Um, uh, Newt Gingrich working together or battling together and coming to some compromise. Uh, we saw on the other side, you know, Reagan and, and Tip O'Neill working together, but 
Um, even if you have a split Congress like we have now, uh, Democratic president working with that split Congress has proven to be uh, at least pretty decent. You can see what we're some of the performance we're getting this year. Republican Congress alone, um, pretty strong, 14.6. Republican Congress and a Democratic and a Republican president, also pretty strong. So Congress might be more impactful to the stock market than the president. Best combination of political alignment being a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. The midterm year, where bottom pickers find uh, paradise. Um, a couple of interesting charts here, a couple of interesting tables here. This is showing the midterm low to the pre-election year high. Um, many people were, uh, um, I don't have the, the current cycle on there, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a bit later. Uh, many were skeptical. There were a few that were looking at the midterm bottom last year. Um, again, you know, once we had our January indicators come through negative in the pre-election year, we were very cautious. And, you know, then we had the invasion of you know, Ukraine and uh, we, we were, you know, letting stops get hit and getting out of positions. And by the time we got our sell signals for the, the best months in April, um, we were pretty much going to cash. A lot of things got stopped out and we were expecting um, the market to continue to move lower uh, into October, which is very typical. Um, there was, you know, a lot of people that jumped on that rally bandwagon in, you know, June, July. Uh, our cycle charts showed us otherwise. And, um, you know, when the market sort of had that uh, uh, quiet turn, it was sort of a rolling recession. I'll get into the perhaps the fact that um, I think we had our recession last year that, and the whole yield curve inversion thing that it isn't as accurate as people like to make it seem. But, um, you know, there was a we had a rolling bear market. We had rolling recession, but we were pretty comfortable that we had our bear market bottom in October. Uh, all of the major indices uh, had an intraday bottom on October 13th. S&P bottom closing on the 12th. Um, Dow was November uh, September 30th, excuse me, and a Nasdaq was uh, December 28th. So this chart showing the uh, midterm low to the pre-election year high, Nasdaq up an average of 68%. Good number of those midterm lows in October in yellow, a good number of the highs, um, which is why we're bullish for fourth quarter in pre-election years is December and several last trading day are very close. On the Dow side, average percent change of about 47% from midterm low to pre-election year high. Some decent number of lows in January here, going back to the, the you know, well, later in history, earlier in history. But still, you see these October bottoms, uh, midterm years, which we had. You can add October 22 to this, this table here, too. But again, December highs. 27th, 31st, 30th, 31st, you see mid-December. The, the largest grouping uh, in any month is December and quite a few at the end of the month. So this is part of what's driving this situation, this, this bullish situation we're in right now. And coming uh, new to the Almanac last year in 2023 was something we've called the sweet spot of the four-year cycle. Other people have picked up on it out there um, in the press and the media. Uh, the pundits. And these are um, two charts that are on page 34 of the 2023 Stock Traders Almanac. If anyone's got a copy, they can they can flip there. I pulled them out because I we added some 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 of the nice numbers here. The the weak spot of the four year cycle is Q2 and Q3 of the midterm year. This happened last year. Um, you know, we sold off right through that, and the the bear market gathered momentum. Uh, and then even after that little summer rally. Um, that got people excited, it fell further. Then the sweet spot of the four-year cycle, um, <clears throat> Dow up 19.3, S&P 20%, NASDAQ 19.3. This is going back um, to 1949. Um, and you can see it graphically down here. I'm going to show you a few other versions of this, but you can see the weak spot going lower, the sweet spot going higher to June, and then sideways through the Q3, Q3 of the, the pre-election year, and then up to new, to new highs at December and a little bit higher into the election year. And then the, the, the worst six months again, and then 
um, a little rally towards the end of the election year as well. So the sweet spot this year delivered um, in the dotted lines. I've got the Dow uh, in red, uh, S&P in green, NASDAQ in blue, going back 49 to 22. The solid colored lines are um, 2021, 20, uh, excuse me, 21, 22, and 23. And these sweet spot gains were 19.8% for the Dow, 24.1% for the S&P. And while NASDAQ had a late year bottom, came back and rallied pretty much on average up over 30.4% uh, for the sweet spot period. And you can see we've been going sideways. Um, yeah, we rallied a little bit further. You'll see on some of the seasonal charts, I'll post later that this, this um you know, mid-July peak is 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 driven by the the Nasdaq seasonal pattern even more so, um, and and we actually are right on point with that. Even a little bit more um, amplitude this this year than than on average. So sideways um, expected for you know through the end of you know September, even into October, then a rally into Q1, a little sideways, but finishing higher. Um, at the end of 2024. Now, I know it's a lot of information here, and I don't want to get too um, too deep into this, but here's the, the bullet point headlines uh, from page 26 of the 2024 Stock Critters Almanac. There's more detail on each one of these, and it refers to, to other pages further throughout the book for, for, um, for looking further. Some of them have charts and much more detail, but Generally, here are some of the 2024 presidential election year perspectives. Um, I was asked yesterday on a podcast, you know, uh, what happens to election years, you know, if the incumbent loses, if, if Biden loses. We're going to start seeing that likelihood in the first five months of the year. The first five months of the year are much better when the party retains the White House. So if we start seeing weakness early, that's going to tell us that. Um, we, we may have a, a change of president, a change of party, which is going to affect the market throughout the year to the downside, even though uh, end of election years are bullish regardless. Either you've got um, uh, um, a, a president that's popular that gets reelected or you've got an unpopular president president that's ousted and the market responds with what I call sort of a ding dong, the witch is dead type of reaction and rallies after, you know, there, there's somebody new coming in. War can be a major factor in, um, in, in presidential races. We do have one going on right now. The market sent a bottom two years after a presidential election. We just went over what happened in 22. Um, only six election year declines greater than 5% since 1896. So it's a good likelihood that even if there is a little, um, you know, softness next year, if something comes up, whether it's related to the, the individuals running or something overseas or something systemic in the market, likely to, to not be a huge um, loss, though I am already uh, having a bullish outlook for, for 2024. Uh, partially because the market is much better when sitting presidents run for re-elections. They have the power of the bully pulpit to make things happen where, you know, they can go and appear more places. They can call, you know, uh, a, a conference or get on TV whenever they want, take all all the the, the network channels, you know, at nine o'clock at night and and make a make a speech. Um, they can also uh, do a lot of things with with uh, with economic you know uh, policies and things like that. Uh, we've got market charts of presidential election years. We talk about exactly how the government manipulates the economy to stay in power, and we look at the comparison of incumbent party wins and losses. And then the big thing is that whatever the situation, whether you've got uh, a weak first five months or or, or not, uh, there's only two losses in the last seven months of election years, and that was 2000 and uh, 2002. Um, so I'm just going to switch gears a little bit and get into some other uh, cycles and patterns and indicators that we feature in the Stock Traders Almanac. Um, the birth of the Santa Claus rally. The January Barometer, both in, invented by Yale Hirsch back in 1972, published in the 1973 Stock Traders Almanac. Um, uh, the Extraordinary January Barometer, first featured here. 
Uh, I could talk about that for, for quite a while, but um, basically the 20th Amendment to the Constitution uh, created uh, the January Barometer, which was passed in 34, ratified in 35, took effect, you know, um, in, in, in the late, in 38, after the large Democratic margins in Congress were, were you know, dissipated. And basically what it did was move new Congresses convening to January instead of 13 months later, which is why they were called lame ducks, or why they were called a lame duck amendment, um, the following December. And it moved inaugurations to uh, January 20th from March 4th. And, you know, we've often had the State of the Union address in January. It's been moved a little bit later these days. Uh, but basically, January, in addition to all the political agendas and policy initiatives being set, you've got um, market analysts and forecasters making projections for the year and people moving their money, all their year end bonuses into the market. And if the prospects aren't good, January's down. So as the market goes in January, so goes the year based on the S&P 500. A little bit more on that in a moment because uh, January has been a bit rough the last several years. And then here's the Santa Claus rally, which uh, I'll discuss on the next slide because I've got some details there. Many people um, uh, think of the Santa Claus rally. And actually, somebody mentioned it yesterday to me that the Santa Claus rally is any year-end rally from October through January, when it's really not. Um, yes, there's that year-end rally, there's that Q4 rally. People like to use the word Santa Claus rally, but uh, as Yale devised it back in 72, it's really an indicator. It's the last five trading days of the year plus the first two trading days of the new year. Uh, it's usually, you know, just the pros, the trading desks working, picking up bargain stocks that were sold for tax loss selling. Myself and many other uh, people out there are away with families celebrating the holidays. And S&P averages a, a modest gain of 1.3%. But when Santa Claus rally fails to materialize, the market's often flat or down. You can see these flat years on the recent uh, history in 94, 05, 2015. We had a mini bear in 2016, but when we had uh, a down Santa Claus rally, uh, we had a bear market in 2000 and again in 2008. And hence the, you know, Yale was a songwriter, as I mentioned earlier. So this wonderful phrase he created, uh, if Santa Claus should fail to call, bears may come to Broadway Wall. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the New York Stock Exchange exists on the intersection of Broad Streets and Wall Streets. A um, couple other notes in here. That downgrade for years that it didn't work. 9-11, uh, build up to Iraq. And then in 2018, we had that uh, Fed rate hike uh, issue in 2018 where the market um, told Jerome Powell to not raise rates. January barometer, as I said, also devised by Yale Hirsch in 73. As January goes for the S&P, and so goes the year. 12 errors since um, 1950, 83.6% accurate, including the eight flat years where the market is only up or down 5% um, or, uh, or percent for, for the year. It's still a 726 batting average, pretty solid. And I mentioned before the lame duck amendment, why the January barometer works. We've compared all the monthly barometers to the calendar year for the S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ, uh, and the subsequent 11 months and the subsequent 12 months. And the only one that has real um, correlation, uh, arguably causation, um, and comes at the beginning of the year, which gives you time to, to make adjustments for the rest of the year, is January for, you know, S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ. It's a couple other months that are correlated, but they don't come early enough of the year to make a difference for NASDAQ. Um, uh, about 2013, my partner Christopher Mistel and I, you know, when thinking about uh, January, the month, the January barometer, um, January, the month getting uh, sold off a bit and the performance reducing and the January barometer having a bunch of misses, we decided to um, look at all the January indicators, and we found that the bulls win when the market hits the January trifecta, uh, standing on Yale shoulders like Sir Isaac Newton, so we could see further. 
We took Yale's Santa Claus Rally and January Barometer and combined it with the first five days indicator, which has been in the Almanac for many years, but also, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a nice one week thing that, that, that's been talked about for a, for a while. Um, we took all three of them and put them together. When all three are up, uh, which was the case this year, um, the S&P 500 has been up 90% of the time, 28 of 31 years for an average gain of 17.5%. The last 11 months after January, up uh, to like 83% of the time um, for 12 12.3% gain. And anytime any of the results are down, um, and any of these indicators are down, the results are diminished. So we hit the trifecta this year. We'll talk more about that when I get into the applied wisdom section. But that's the trifecta. And this is a new feature in the 2024 Stock Traders Almanac. The best six months, you got to buy in October before you sell in May. Um, just want to pause for a second, look at the chat and see how we're doing out there. I know I've been rolling along here. I've got a few, a bunch more overall stuff to go over before we get into there. But if I know it's about 40 minutes, I haven't been going for 40 minutes, but everything okay out there, Lynn? Uh, one of the questions was, will the slides be posted? Um, yeah, I mean, you can post them or, or you can, uh, you know, you can email them. I can email them to you. You can contact me for them one way or the other. We can get you the slides. Okay. If you any send other... them, to... go ahead. Go ahead. I don't believe there's any other, um, questions at this point. Okay. Um, I know it's a lot of information. If you're going to take a pause, but, um, I will continue with the best months. So the best six months um, was something Yale discovered back in 1986. Um, you can call it the Halloween indicator, sell in May, whatever. It works. We call it the best six months. Um, first discovered and published by Yale in the 1987 Stock Traders Almanac back in 76. And it's really been a bonanza for investors, capturing the bulk of the market's gains um, from November to April. Um, now, I just want to—I'll explain this chart, but I want—I want to tell you one thing. Back back in there's a book called Evidence-Based Technical Analysis um, by uh, David Aronson, um, renowned technician. And back in 08, we picked his book. He did it with Tim Masters at the Brute College, which is affiliated with the CMT, um, and they do some some great work. They took six thousand plus black box systems trading systems and put them through the scientific method, you know, disproving the null hypothesis and um, found that none of them had predictive power and all the, the results were, were the result of chance. And we asked him to take um, the best six months, <clears throat> excuse me, and put it through the same paces. <clears throat> and what they found was starting in 1987, the year after we, we put it out there, that unlike all the other 6,000 uh, plus systems that they tested, it was found to be valuable, have predictive power, and statistically significant. And the seasonality, we believe, has clear causation driven by the recurring behavior of institutions and their financial calendars. You know, this whole October thing, October phobia, and the selling that we're seeing here in September, the seasonal weakness everyone's talking about, um, it's all driven by the you know repetitive behaviors, the behavioral activities of institutions, fund managers, algorithms, algorithmic trading, as well as which is written by humans, and also the behaviors of all of us. So um, fund managers want to you know window dress, clean up their portfolios ahead of the third, the fourth quarter. They do it at the end of the third quarter. There's also the October 31st deadline for for funds to reconcile their accounting with the you know previous 10 months the year's 10 months the full calendar year and the current year's 10 months that's what an IRS an IRS rule so that it can file their, their their accounting reconciliation by year end and that's pretty much um part of the reason or one of the major drivers of the 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 you know best and worst months on this chart Let's see, is my pointer working? There it is. 
Uh, the red line here, it goes back to 1901 and 1949. The first half of the 20th century was an agrarian economy driven by farming and agriculture. You see, in, you see it's sort of a buy in May situation, sell in September. Interestingly, the September weakness prevails in all of these cycles. Um, now we've got this window dressing, you know, restru portfolio restructuring I just mentioned. Back then it was, you know, they had to pay off their loans when the harvest came in. But you see the beginning of hiring and, and buying of fuel and, and, and seed and fertilizer and equipment, and it drives all the cash flow in the economy. Then after World War II, the military industrial complex, arguably the pharmaceutical industrial complex or whatever service industrial complex you want to talk about. You can see in the black line since 1950, from May to October, market's pretty much gone nowhere. Uh, everyone else says sell in May. I don't want to talk about the old sell in May and go away, coming back on St. Ledger's Day. If somebody wants to ask me about that, I can tell that old about that old British saw in the Q&A. But um, basically, uh, the vacation, um, you know, uh, uh, behavior and the, the fact that, you know, we're all in the Northern Hemisphere, there's more daylight, people are out doing other things with the family, you know, backyards, uh, uh, vacations, camps for kids, you know, people playing a lot more golf, doing a lot more outdoor stuff, takes away from the trading desk. There's the summer volume doldrums that, you know, has less uh, volume, which sort of uh, uh, has markets go down, but there's a lot of chop, markets prone to weakness and sell-offs, but it's really a sideways trading pattern. So it's not sell in May and go away, it's repositioning in May for us. Um, the green line since since the 87 crash goes back to 88 shows the pattern. We like to look at things over different time frames to confirm this, uh, confirm you know cycles and patterns. Uh, same basic shape, a little bit more amplitude, less years, but Basically, not much changes where the market makes very little progress May to October and makes most of its gains from November through April. Looking at a page out of the stock traders almanac, this is the the chart you know that we that Yale sort of made this this discovery had this epiphany on epiphany. Um, excuse me. Uh, we've seen a, a change in July and October um, over the years, but basically, you see the best three months of the year consecutive three months, um, November, December, January, March and April, very strong. Uh, you put that together, you have the best six months of the year. February is the weakling, of course, and you can see this sort of dry patch from May through um, uh, September. We like to start buying for the best six months in October. And um, I'll show you some of the techniques we use there uh, in a moment. And um, then, you know, July, the first month of the third quarter has been stronger. Uh, but it tends to be weak towards the end. The best six months, I explained that black box system. Uh, and just a little quick look at the numbers here. The average performance for the best months in the Dow, going back November to April, is 7.3% since 1950. 0 0.8, 0 0.8% made to October. Using a sort of example, a hypothetical uh, $10,000 investment, one-time investment in 1950, gives you a gain of over a million dollars in the best months, whereas you get a gain of $3,400 in the worst months. Using our simple MACD timing indicator um, increases those uh, returns um, for November to April to 8.9%. The little gain turns into a little loss of uh, minus 0.5%. And it nearly triples the results of that $10,000 investment to over $3 million. And the short, small gain of 3,400 turns into a loss of about $5,400. So the technical timing trigger works. So here's our basic formula. Um, we like to buy in October, get our portfolio sober, and then reposition in May to July. Um, this is what we do. We utilize MACD to aid in shifting from aggressive to defensive. We put out our best six months or eight months for NASDAQ. Buy signal on or after October 1st. We email that, that to subscribers. The sell signal for Dow and S&P is on or after April 1st. Um, and NASDAQ June 1st. 
In the fall, we roll out new trades in October, November for the index, for the, the, the strategy, the tactical switching strategy portfolio, the index ETFs, Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, Russell 2000, uh, DIA, SPY, and the IWM and QQQ. We get into this series of October sectors. I'll show you the sector strategy calendar in a moment uh, for the sector rotation portfolio. And we pick new, new stocks. We put cash back to work. And I'm going to tell you how we pick stocks um, in a second as well. So May to July, we reposition. We do sell some things, but we don't go away. You know, the old key to su trading, investing success is sell your losers short and fast and let your winners ride. We do, uh, we have a couple of strategies for selling. One of our favorites for stocks is to sell half on a double. And um, that's our standard, you know, selling procedure. And, you know, take your initial investment off the table, let your winnings ride. We shift the bonds, ETFs, and cash for the tactical portfolio. We go into the worst six-month sectors for the sector rotation. We put stocks on hold, tighten up stop losses, and we look at uh, potential uh, defensive baskets of stocks um, once we get our NASDAQ sell signal uh, sometime after June 1. Quick look at the MACD. I can explain MACD, uh, the ones that we use in the Q&A, if, if anyone's interested or if you want to chime in and interrupt me, I can. But we use the 12.26.9 on the sell side and the 8.17.9 on the buy side. Uh, shorter, faster for getting into bottoms are more of an event, you're getting quicker. Tops are more of a process. Uh, so we use the slower, longer MACD, the standard one that everyone looks at. Um, just a couple of looks at some of the recent signals. Our April 22 sell, we avoided much of this uh, downdraft in, in 22. We got back in October 4th on a little pop in the month. It would have been great to get in at September 30th or the end of October uh, or you know mid-October, but that's the way the, the signal crumbles. And then our sell signal um, in April for the S&P and Dow, Yes, left a little bit on the table, but we'll, we'll see where we end up uh, come the end of September, October, when we <clears throat> when we get our buy signal. Maybe we'll be um, a little bit flatter than we look right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the NASDAQ side, um, showing the last couple of signals here, captured a bit more of the gain staying through till uh, June 22nd. You can see the, the crossover here on the 1226 for that sell signal. The positive crossover up the MACD line going through the signal line uh, back on October 4th. And one of the things that we, we do for our buy signals is we want all three indexes to agree. So we want <clears throat> a new crossover trigger for Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ all to happen either you know after each other or at the same time. Same thing on the sell side. We're looking for both Dow and, and, and NASDAQ excuse me, Dow and S&P in April, and then just NASDAQ in June. Here's a quick look at our sector seasonality calendar. This is right out of page 94 of the Stock Traders Almanac. And um, you can see this big cluster of longs here in October. Most of the, the major sectors come into play. The B is for the beginning of the month. The M is for the middle of the month. And the E is the end of the month. We break the month up into thirds looking for a uh, better buying opportunity at the beginning, middle, or ends of months. Um, we've got some shorts in here, which I'm going to talk about. I'll show you some of those in the next section. Um, <clears throat> one we passed on. <clears throat> a few recent ones have been triggered. And um, then, and you can see we have the, the three different time frames, 15-year, 10-year, and 25-year for these, these different sector seasonality trades. We're six-month sectors. Just a quick look. Um, one of the things that we're looking at here is the plurality of gains versus the average gain. You can have the median gains. You can have, you know, one great year swing the averages. Biotech's a decent sector to get into. We think it's a great sector for the long term. Information tech as well. We're looking to get into that. Waiting for a dip on that. Healthcare hasn't been all that great, but again, another. Um, a great sector for the long hauls as, as well as the, the worst months, staples, and of course, uh, bonds and um, utilities. Utilities, we got stopped out of 
Uh, I think that the bond numbers um, have, uh, uh, you know, definitely taken away some of the luster of utility gains. So let's just a look at the, the worst six month sectors. You can see how they do. July is usually pretty strong. June, August, September, uh, where most of these, these the sectors have some trouble. I've got a few other um, seasonal trading patterns I want to touch on before we take a break, if that's okay, if everyone's still good. Uh, on on the MACD, oh, I see a question here. MACD is daily MACD. And yeah, good question, Mark. Thank you for asking that. Glad I checked if there's any more. Okay, that's a good one. Um, that's daily, 12.26.9 daily and 8.17.9. Um, all right. So this is one of the things that um, I was seeing the change live and, and was watching the analysis when I first started working full time uh, with my father back in the early 90s. Um, and this is the typical monthly trading pattern. This is uh, just um, up versus down from the previous. This is one of the things I did by hand in underlining the the the. The, the days in barons with a little ruler and a little red red pen. Um, I still have that ruler now, but we no longer get this stuff in barons anymore because it, they, they don't quite produce the way they used to. But we used to have a stack of lab pages as tall as me going back to 66 in my father's office closet. Um, wish we still had all that. But uh, basically, back in the old days, you had the um, last day of the month and the first four of the month was the, the monthly five-day bulls where most of the markets gained, most of the markets gains were made. First trading day of the month has still got some strength to it. Um, not gonna get heavily into that right now, but the rest of the month, um, you might as well, you know, parked it in cash and, and, and waited for that, you know, probably get in in the, the second last trading day for the, those four days. Then something shifted and we see this mid-month spike. Um, we, you know, realized that this was from um, the, uh, you know, uh, IRA and 401k, the, you know, retirement um, accounts, the, the payroll deductions. Most people get paid every two weeks or twice a month, mid-month and end of month. So you can see that money coming into the funds and having to be deployed. And that's where you see this, um, this spike. Uh, so now we've got sort of a super eight days but it's it's changing again, and we're observing, we're you know we're making some observations there. But you know the last few days of the month, and the first two, and then the middle three tend to be um, the most bullish. Um, so that is a shifting pattern there. Let's see if there's another question. MACD is daily. Yep. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> days of the week. This was the sort of where Yale got the title for his book, Don't Sell Stocks on Monday. Monday used to be the worst trading day of the month from 1950 through 89. Um, things kind of shifted and Monday became a very strong day. But during the last 22 years, Tuesday has produced uh, the most gains on average and Wednesday has been up the most. So um, nowadays, Tuesday and Wednesday, the midweek, people have trouble staying in uh, over the weekend. And coming back on Monday, and there's a little down Friday, down Monday indicator that we look at. That's just a quick look at the um, days of the week. Um, intraday trading patterns. Um, this is interesting. Despite all the algorithmic trading and despite, you know, um, all the things that have transpired. And this is another thing that I did by hand with uh, uh, um, Excel spreadsheet and, um, you know, adding machine. Um, you see the the this week period back in the afternoon still materialize, and this you know strength towards the close opens are a little bit weaker. You got a pre lunch sort of sell off, and then a post lunch purchase you know buy. So the intraday trading patterns, and this is from the back of the 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 um, the trading pattern section of the stock traders almanac. This is right out of the twenty four. So just a little bit on on intraday trading patterns, a typical day in the stock market. Um, I talked about the down Friday, down Monday morning, Monday warning. It's not just Friday and Monday. It's first trading day of the week uh, is really Monday. And last trading day of the week is Monday. Often we have Monday and Friday holidays. I mean, you can see it's kind of an inflection point. 
um, in the market. And sometimes we see clusters of these, uh, as we did in in 02. It was a warning, you know, confirming uh, weakness in the market when um, traders and investors uh, want to close out positions, uh, square away positions on Friday before going to the weekend. Then they look at their accounts. They hear the news over the weekend and they come back Monday. They're still not interested in the market. There's more selling on Monday. That tends to be uh, an inflection point warning. Are there small cap trading patterns for four stocks, uh, which funds of ETFs? I have something on small cap stocks um, in a moment. There's a different seasonal trade. I know small stocks have been a little bit weaker, um, and they tend to be weaker when there's major bull market moves going on. Um, I mentioned the sweet spot of the four-year cycle, but the fourth quarter is the strongest quarter, strongest quarter of all. Regardless, you've got weak quarters, Q2 and Q3, Q1 and Q, Q4 to Q1 is the strongest. You can see um, pre-election year, Q4, pretty strong, pretty strong on all of them, except for the election year uh, for NASDAQ. But generally, Q4 is the strongest quarter, um, something that is coming up pretty soon. Um, we do cover some holiday trading patterns. It's not all the same. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to give you uh, um, th this information that uh, it's changed over the years. It used to be, you know, pre-holiday was was great and post-holiday was bad, but now it's sort of different holiday by holiday. President's Day still seems to be the one that's weakest before and after. That sits in February. Um, you've got positive uh, before and after um, at the end of the year, mixed around Labor Day. So there's holiday trading patterns. And in the newsletter, we put out, you know, what's relevant each and every month. And I will post some of the stuff out in our blog. Uh, and if you want to track me on Twitter, it's at Almanac Trader. I don't know if you guys are, are Twitter people. Um, seems to work. Triple witching is a big issue. Options expiration. I'm not a proponent of quadruple witching. I don't think single stock futures or ETFs uh, make a bit of difference to the market. There's very little volume there. It has no impact whatsoever. As far as I'm concerned, you can see weakness around um, triple witching in June and September, um, which is what's coming up here in September. We've had some really nasty sell-offs in the week after triple witching towards the end of Q3. Watch out for that. But it is stronger <clears throat> in December at the end of the year. And um, March isn't bad, but there's also some end of Q one selling there. So that's right out of the almanac as well. Uh, getting to the small stock question. Um, here's the seasonal pattern of small stocks versus uh, what is triple witching? Triple witching is when um, three times a year, it started back in 1982, uh, four times a year in March, um, June, September, and December, you have monthly options expiration on stocks. Um, stock index options and stock index futures all expiring on the same day of the month. That is the third Friday of the month. And that's the three things, stock options, um, stock index options, stock index futures are the three things that triple witches that expire right there. There's some talk about, there's you know also single stock futures that people like to call it quad witch, but they don't, um, they're not really traded and I don't find them relevant. Small stocks, um, there used to be something called the January effect. It was an old guy named Sidney Wachtel who did the research back in the 40s. We've carried in the Almanac for years um, that from December 15th to January 15th, small stocks outperformed the indexes um, for that, you know, from December 15th to February 15th. We've seen that shift. Um, it's really most of it takes effect in the last two weeks of December. Now, this chart on the left is the Russell 2000 over the Russell 1000, just a simple ratio. You can see for most of the year, the small stocks are underperforming. And this starts in uh, July um, through June. We split the year up differently so we could highlight this, this low period that is coming up for us with small stocks. And this is when we, this is when we pick most of our stocks, most of our, you know, uh, fun on my screen stocks. And I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, show you, tell you what our screen is. 
Um, this <clears throat> frequent end of August Labor Day spike did not transpire this year. I'll show that a little bit further in the next section. Um, and then small stocks tend to bottom um, <clears throat> in uh, uh, you know from October to December, and you see that big move, most of it in the last two weeks of December, and then a little bit further into late February, early March. On the right side is a table showing um, the different two week periods. And this was, you know, quite a, 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 an epiphany for us to see that most of these gains are made from December 15th to December um, 31st. This is really the uh, 11th trading day to the last trading day of the month. Um, and just um, how much better the, the Russell 2000 does than the Russell 1000 over that time frame. Um, and even just, uh, you still get a pretty good move over the whole uh, section, you know, twice as, basically uh, twice as much um, <clears throat> upside uh, for the 2000 as for the, the 1000 large caps, the small caps do better than large caps. All right, so I'm gonna finish up this section with our stock screening process generally. And um, this could, you know, this could be lengthy, but, Generally, you know, we don't just pick stocks every month. It's not a stock of the month club. We use our our, our seasonal overlay to get into sector seasonality and stock market seasonal strength at the right times of the year, especially if it's setting up um, like it is this year, like it did last year. Um, had some great picks last year. Uh, we had sent a super microcomputer at eighty three bucks, which you'll see on the on the portfolio. Uh, next section um, that ended up becoming the biggest holding of the Russell 2000 on the AI, you know, chip uh, in fueled rally. <clears throat> um, we look for longs around October, uh, November. We get into some shorts over the summer, um, and we sort of invert the process for the short side. What we do is. You know, around when we get our MACD uh, buy signal, um, October, November, we take the Zach's Research Wizard um, database of about 8,000 stocks, and we do a very laborious stock screen by hand um, using uh, Excel and not just some macros. And what we're looking at, we have a, we have a couple of dozen different, um, you know, fundamental screen criteria. It's pretty robust, but we're really focusing on uh, highlighting or, or, or pinpointing uh, revenue growth and acceleration, earnings growth and acceleration. And we look for some, some attractive valuations uh, of stocks that are having this growth and, and acceleration of growth with margins, PEs, price to sales ratios that I mentioned, one of the first things I learned in stock analysis, cash flows, we want good debt pictures, and we look at ratings. We don't really care what the other analysts are saying, what their ratings are. We're looking for how many analysts are following the stock. Um, so if all things being equal with two stocks that are you know, growing great, accelerating great valuations, and one of them is followed by 20 analysts or something like that, another one's followed by a handful, you know, three or four or five, whatever, we're gonna go for the one that's followed by less. The logic being that once this you know, um, growth and valuation that we're seeing becomes recognized by the street, more analysts are gonna follow it and it's going to move higher. Um, we're also looking for relative strength uh, on the technical side. We want stocks to be um, not uh, um, behind the market, not way ahead of it. We wanna be sort of tracking the market, just humming along, kicking off good numbers uh, under Wall Street's radar. And then, you know, we get into, um, picking the prices, the buy limits, and stop losses. When we when we provide stocks to people, stock recommendations to our subscribers, it's not just what to buy. It's when to buy it, at what price, where to put your buy limit, where to put your stop loss. We update those stop losses. And then we'll also we'll recommend a sell if we go there. But their standard selling procedure is selling half on a double, which I mentioned earlier. Um, to pick those buy limits, we're looking at chart patterns, and um, support resistance and relative strength and stochastics and um, a little bit of uh, art, um, you know, technical analysis art. So we, we break it up into three different market caps. Under a billion is small cap. Um, 
billion to five billion is mid cap and over five is large cap, a little bit smaller than the mega caps folks are, are looking for, or folks talk a lot about these days. Um, we want to make sure there's some insider holdings and we want to make sure that there's some average trading volume so that there's some liquidity and it's not some fly by night um, or, or at least, you know, very thinly traded stock that uh, any sort of purchasing or any sort of trading action will, will, will move it. So it's basically a combination of seasonal overlay and old school fundamental and technical stock analysis and, um, you know, some discipline with uh, stop losses. And you'll see some of that in the in, in the next section. And with that, I think we can take a pause here. Um, it's probably a good time. Hopefully that wasn't too much, but I was trying to fill the bill. Well, uh, we'll take a break now and restart at 10 in 10 minutes at, at 10.24 Pacific time. Oh, I did hit 10.15 pretty good, didn't I? Yes. Yeah. On a double purchase price. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, Bob, I answered that question. And again, if you want guys want to follow up, you can send me an email, go to our website, shoot an email through that, or call the, the phone number. I don't know if I'm going to pick it up today, but you can always leave a message and get back. So what is half on a double? So one of the um, original, you know, profit-taking uh, uh, um, portfolio management techniques that we've always used is, and the stocks that we pick, we're, we're always looking for them to double, um, even, the, even the large cap ones. So selling half on a double from the purchase price. Let's say you purchase stocks, stock XYZ at $10 a share. It goes up to $20 a share. We sell half, not of the shares, but half of the dollar value. So if you had a hundred, you know, dollars a share, or ten dollars a share, a hundred shares, it's a thousand dollars. You sell five hundred dollars worth of the stock. Take your uh, uh, sell. It goes up to twenty dollars. You have two thousand dollars. Excuse me. You sell a thousand dollars worth of the stock. Take your initial thousand dollars off the table and let the rest ride. So sell half on a double. Let your winnings ride. Sorry, I fumbled that a little bit. That's fine, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to put up, there was a question in the chat about the information that was shared at the beginning. So I'm going to put that up on the screen during the break. And uh, I'll, Jeff, why don't you close yours out and then uh, I'll put something up and you can just look at that uh, during the break. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, screen's up again, right? Yes. All right. There was a couple of good questions in there. Um, let me pull up the chat. So Celeste was asking about the down Friday, down Monday. Um, it doesn't necessarily re represent a high or a low. It represents an inflection point. And the arrows are highlighting where they are, so you can see how they um, where they happen in the market. Um, if you want to try to look at that chart, I guess I could go back to that. I'm not sure we want to spend all that time on there, but it does. We do track it in our pulse of the market, which I'm going to show you. And what we're looking for um, is a cluster of down Fridays and down Mondays. And when and you see a series of down Fridays followed by down Mondays, or even just a series of down Fridays, you, you're looking at a market that's, you know, um, weak. Uh, and then when you see sometimes a cluster of them, it shows a low point. If it's just starting, it can show a high, uh, or when it's starting to turn lower. So it's not an exact science. It's just a warning to, you know, alert you to pay more attention to what's going on in the market. Hopefully that helps. Stop losses levels. Um, how do we filter out swings, breaching, or stop loss levels? Well, I mean, it's unavoidable. We've all gotten stopped out of things. One of the things that we do is we don't put hard stops into the market. It's not like I put a stop loss in my trading account. Our stop losses are triggered only on the close. And if a stock in our portfolio closes below that stop loss level, we will sell it the next day using our day trading techniques 
or whatever, you know, selling, you don't just go in and sell it in the morning per se, but you know, if you want to get out of it, you can, that's when you have to become a little bit of a trader. Um, we also don't have specific levels, um, but generally I know, you know, O'Neill um, and company uses and IBD uses seven, eight percent. That's fine for big cap stocks, that vicinity. We usually leave a lot more leeway, a lot more room on small caps that have a greater standard deviation, something in the, in the realm of 20 percent. But we will use the charts. We will look for uh, gaps, consolidations, other levels on the chart that we f feel, um, you know, is an appropriate support level that if it's broken would be a good stop loss. And, you know, we like everybody, we've left money on the table. We've gotten whipsawed from time to time. But by doing it on a closing basis and by using the charts and giving small caps more room, we have um, avoided uh, a, a lot of um, whipsawing and, 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 you know, breaching those levels. The right threshold for PEs and price to sale ratios is also relative. It depends upon the sector, depends upon interest rates, it depends upon the market. But generally, we're looking at PE and price to sales ratios that are um, below uh, the broad market, say the S&P or the Dow or the NASDAQ or the sector that we're looking at and something that's you know, relatively low. I mean, the, the old the old you know method was uh, a price to sales ratio of one um, is good. You're not going to find so much. So we're looking for you know single digits and price to sales if possible. And you know, something that's below the market or below the sector on PE. Bobby's saying it will also help if you can demo how to filter the great stocks from the current market and how to experiment on those metrics on our own in the future. Yeah, well, that's something that's sort of the special sauce. That's something I've given to um, paid events. That's something I will do for individuals, uh, but that's not just something I do for free. Um, and it's a big process. Uh, I have performed it um, for groups, uh, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a paid event at the money show. Um, but if you're interested in doing that, you know, that's a personal thing we can do. You can reach out and uh, we can figure something out. That's real personal coaching. Um, if you could use only one seasonal indicator, what would it be? Uh, the best and worst months, hands down, would be the only thing I did, would do. Um, and that's probably the best one. And I do think the um, four-year cycle and the January indicator trifecta um, is is appropriate, is a great, you know, or great patterns as well. But the best six months, worst six months um, is the way to go, is the one I would use. So I think I covered all those questions. Um, let's jump in to the second to part two. Um, just a, a quick look at our annual forecast from for, for 2023 that we put out last year. We do it every December, um, just before Christmas, our last newsletter of the, um, you know, our outlook for the year, December 22nd. Um, you can read the whole thing yourself, but basically, um, We've shifted uh, initially base case was looking pretty good, but we shifted to the best case scenario once we hit the January trifecta. A lot of these things have um, <clears throat> transpired. There's some other things that haven't, but generally we are uh, quite ahead of the above average pre-election year gains at 15 and 20 percent. And all this changed. This is the same chart again, but just want to tell you all of this changed when we became more best case scenario at the end of January when we hit this trifecta. Um, one of the things that uh, this is when we upped our forecast that I, you know, I'm recorded as saying and, and, and written down in many places, you know, in February um, of this year was that if I was one thing I was most afraid of was not being bullish enough. And that shirt, you know, came true because the market went um much higher than the averages in our outlook. Uh, it's come back some, came back a bunch in March, which is kind of when we were leaning back to base case a bit. But generally, um, pre-election years, January trifecta after midterm bear market, pretty bullish. 
Um, and let's look at some of the charts here. Um, this is NASDAQ. Um, you can see we're getting uh, seasonal weakness has been delivered, and we think there's more to come. You can see NASDAQ's best eight months goes up into mid-July. Uh, this is a chart we've been tracking for quite a while. Um, on this chart, the black line is all years, not just pre-election years, for NASDAQ back to 71. The blue line is all pre-election years for NASDAQ um, back to 71. And this red line is my aggregate cycle that I mentioned earlier, which is a combination of all years, pre-election years, and the third year of the decade or the relevant uh, um, centennial cycle year uh, currently. So this is sort of third years, not sort of, it's exactly third years, and it's an average of third years, pre-election years, and all years. And you can see the patterns are pretty much the same, a little more flatness on all years, but you've got uh, rally up until mid-July, selling into August, um, weakening here in, in you know, uh, middle of September. We're seeing some of that earlier. The last few days, you know, last week was kind of difficult, but continuing to move potentially lower uh, through October and into the end of October. 23 in purple has tracked that trend a little bit more on the upside. It was further up on the upside in the early part of the year. It came back, you know, in, into the mean, reverted to the mean again. Potentially that could happen here again. Um, but either way, we're looking at, uh, you know, further upside. I don't have another up arrow for you here, but you can see that we're likely to rally in November, December, and especially right at the end of the year, like I showed you in that, um, you know, midterm uh, low to pre-election year high table. Um, looking at the S&P version of this, slightly different lines on here. I'll, I'll show you what they are. The um, vacation is over, uh, but um, we had that little rally here, uh, and we're looking at some September, October phobia coming up. So again, red line is that aggregate cycle it goes back to 49 here for the S&P of pre-election years, all years, and the third years of the, the, the decade. And, you know, I mentioned a pre-election uh, after bear, the midterm bear I talked about um, that we were, were pretty adamant about uh, happening last year and then bottoming in October. So this green line is pre-election years after a midterm bear market. The blue line is first term um, president's pre-election years. And then the black line here is all pre-election years. And you can see, again, a similar thing came above the, the averages, reverted below the mean, and now we're sort of back on track, got a little bit higher and towards the end of August. We actually had a end of July um, peak here um, and some decent selling. Uh, people have asked me if I think we can take out those August lows. I think it's possible, uh, potentially likely, not necessarily so significant to me, whether we actually bounce off that low, go a little bit lower. Um, maybe this June low becomes into play or somewhere in this area. Depends upon how thick you want to draw your, your support line or whatever it is. And sometimes those support lines get taken out and then they make new support lines. Bottom line from my vantage point, you know, this is the usual time in the um, cycle that this happens. We are concerned that there could be some sort of September surprise from the financial sector, perhaps some sort of downgrade. Um, but either way, I expect this weakness to be temporary and the market to continue to track these seasonal patterns. So we want to be patient and, you know, uh, stay on the sidelines, uh, keep our powder dry and wait for that fatter pitch in October, wait for our, our, our MACD buy signal. And um, then we're, we're probably already looking, we're already looking bullish for, for 24 with the power of the sitting president. And we'll talk more about that shortly. Um, one of the big things is that, um, you know, inflation's probably done cooling and, um, you know, we're concerned about that September surprise. There was, um, a lot of talk, uh, a little while back about, you know, the seasonal stuff that have, everyone's been talking about in, in, in the, the financial media, CNBC, Bloomberg, wherever, wherever you watch Fox business <clears throat> and, the thinking was that, you know, we had a down August. We'd have a, would take away from the week September, the worst month of the year, even though August is also a pretty bad month of the year. 
Um, and uh, and then, you know, because we had such big year-to-date gains, you know, in, in August, over 15%, and August was down, September would be up. Yeah, you know, we looked at it, um, uh, 33 um, down August were followed by 17 down September's, uh, so just about 50-50. 20 Octobers um, uh, were, were gaining, were up for two and a quarter percent. Um, and the last four months of the year, uh, up 5%, almost 80% of the time. Um, and, you know, the uh, year's up um, about 8.3%, 64% of the time. I mean, you can see all this on the two charts I just showed you. August is generally pretty weak. <clears throat> September's weak also. October tends to be a turn. Um, but um, when we're talking about this little data set with the 15% year-to-date gains and August being down, yeah, six of the seven Septembers were down. Uh, well, excuse me, scratch that reverse, it were up. But the following, um, you know, five of the seven Octobers were down. And uh, one of the ones that was up was followed by, in, in 75, was followed by a down August and a down September. And the other one, August and September were kind of net, you know, flat. Uh, and five of these Octobers were pre-election years. Um, the All the odd ones there uh, were the pre-election years. So we might have a good September. Um, it's kind of off to a little bit of a rocky start, but even if we do or don't, September's, you know, October's bound to be rocky as well. We are just concerned with um, the seasonal weakness here with the fundamental and technical situations out there, the market internals. Um, sentiment had gotten kind of bullish again. It sold off. Uh, you know, there is a potential for a surprise. The cycle, the, the 23 and the and the current cycle from 21 through now is tracking the four year and the seasonal very closely. Um, so we're just on on watch for um further weakness over the next couple of months. Uh, but probably setting up a very nice buying opportunity. Back after the end of July, you know, we have this thing, hot July's often lead to you know late autumn buys. Um, and here's just a sort of update of these July gains of more than 3%. Got NASDAQ over here on the left, um, S&P in the middle, and Dow on the right. Basically, we've had this, this you know, um, current low uh, down 7.4% off the, the July highs. Um, the end of July for NASDAQ. About four, four and a half, five percent for you know almost five percent for S and P and four for for the Dow. Very typical behavior. I think we can get even a lower low. You can see a bunch of these lows, you know, have October numbers in there. There's some August in there. Um, I'm still not convinced that uh, we've seen the the rest of this correction, but I'm not looking for a major sell off. You know, five to ten percent um, and a better buying opportunity, waiting for that fatter pitch. Um, so I don't think the correction's over. Um, again, I showed you some of these numbers the, from the, from the 23 highs to the August lows, <clears throat> the 23 high for the Russell was much earlier in the year. It was February. Um, uh, but, um, this is from those recent highs there. We think inflation's done cooling. It's raising concerns. Um, the fed, um, is not likely to cut soon, probably higher for longer. And again, the end of um, September and Q3 is pretty rough. And of course, October phobia looms. Looms large. Um, but so far, as of a couple of days ago, the bull market gains off of the um, October, off of the, the, the lows um, in 22, 20%, 20.6% 20 for Dow, 25.7% for um S and P Nasdaq thirty seven point three the Nasdaq one hundred forty five point two and Russell bringing up the rear with the the issues the small caps are having at fourteen uh, percent that's just the bull market gains off their twenty two midterm uh, lows September um, 
this is something we put out for subscribers. I've also uh, put it out, you know, earlier for subscribers. I also put it out in the blog. You can see that um, September opens week. It's open even weaker this year, but it closes even weaker with that end of Q3 selling, that triple witching week after that I mentioned. And pre-election years don't do anything to improve September's prospects. Still ranked at the bottom for, you know, the major indices, uh, second from the last for Russell 2000. So we're looking for um, further weakness in October. In September, maybe even in October. Um, pulse of the market is something that we share with um, subscribers every month. Uh, we've highlighted here the down Fridays and down Mondays. Um, you can see it created a, pointed to a little bit of a low point here, as it was Celeste was asking earlier. But this comes out of the back of the stock traders almanac with the um, weekly indicator data. Um, we've got the weekend for the Dow, the change for the week, the change on Friday and Monday to see if there's any persistence in down Fridays and or down Mondays or a combination of the two. The weekly changes for the S&P and the Dow. You can see we've had a little bit of weakness here in the end of August. And then we run the market internals, um, advanced declines. You can see we had some, some difficulty here with the market breadth. Uh, towards the end of August, <clears throat> a little bit of improvement, but you know when a you know real uh, the, when the rally begins to take um, hold again, we'll see uh, advances expanding and being uh, much greater than than um, the decliners. New highs and new lows again. New highs diminishing, new lows rising. Not the strongest situation. <clears throat> Put call ratios uh, <clears throat> being a little elevated. And rates, of course, you know, hitting new highs, um, which is uh, <clears throat> put some pressure on on equities. Our market at a glance, um, looking at the five disciplines. This is from the in the last <clears throat> September outlook we put out at the end of August. Uh, seasonal bearish um, fundamentals, not great. It's not horrible. Um, We've seen some projections for Q3 go up a little bit. Uh, I'll have a look at that in a second. Technicals, it was bouncing, but um, the, the headline risk seems to have knocked things back. And then this, the, as the month turned into September, um, the weakness uh, you know, came back and the market jitters um, reappeared. Uh, the Fed, not convinced that they really know what they're going to do next. <clears throat> I'll show you the CME futures in a second. Looks like pretty clear we're not going to get any increases um, or cuts uh, in, in next week or, or the next on the 20th. And then um, sentiment uh, has retreated a bit as, uh, you know, things sold off, um, which is a little healthy for, for the market rally we've seen here. <clears throat> and the small stocks that are underperforming, um, this is the other chart from, from the Stock Traders Almanac, uh, just to show you that um, one of the things, you know, that we've seen the small caps spike in uh, 2020 and early 21, but they've been in retreat since. And what we want to note here is that the small cap advantage tends to wane during major bull moves um, and intensifies um, when, when people, you know, when, when traders look for bargain, let's go bargain hunting. So this weakness in, in, in the small caps is, is, um, common when you see a major bull move that, that we think we're in right now. And again, just to remind you, we're entering that seasonal week period for small caps. So we're going to be waiting until we get through October until we start looking for small caps again. Um, the 10-year yield, bad 10-year yields rising. Um, you know, it did poke above that 4.33% uh, yield as it, the high it made back in um, October of last year. It came up through this downtrend. You can see how the rallying um, 10 year note uh, was uh, difficult for the SP. And as it came down, the SP rose here. And then when we had some, some uh, increases in the, in the 10 year note, um, SP you know, had some pressure. And this is one of the things we can, we're concerned about, you know, in March when we when we spoke to our members 
that, um, you know, this could be something that that would put pressure on the market and, you know, potentially knock us off of our um, best case scenario. And then we also had the banking fear, uh, you know, the, the banking crisis, as well as the downgrade from Fitch. But um, while we did poke a pub there, we seem to have found some support around that level, rallied again, you know, in the beginning of the month, but come off a little bit. So something we're still watching, something that's potentially a, um, you know, short term negative short term pressure for the equity market. Inflation has people concerned. Um, and we did this projection comparison uh, and showing that the easy inflation comparisons are ending. Um, we had a little uptick in inflation last month. And what we're showing here is that um, if the month over month <clears throat> CPI change is anything less than, uh, you know, anything more than 2%, we're not going to be able to get to the Fed's projected uh, or, or, you know, 2% inflation. I don't think we're ever going to get it. I think 2% inflation, I'm sure they'll find some uh, metric that they'll be able to say, hey, we got the 2%. Maybe it'll be something in the PCE deflator. But the numbers that I've seen average over the long haul is about 3, 3.2 or 3% for the CPI. And that's, you know, my gauge and what I think is more relevant. But you can see that any sort of uptick in um, of more than 2% is going to have that 12-month CPI percent change getting up over 3% and, and even higher. So something else we're watching here. Um, inflation is clearly done cooling from our standpoint. Maybe we need a few more data points to confirm that. But we had quite a nice... Uh, retreat inflation. This is the uh, producer price index in red, uh, the final demand one, all consumer, um, all items, CPI in the blue, and the PCE one in the um, uh, uh, green. Yeah, we did get below 2% for the PPI, so maybe, maybe that's what they'll look at. But basically, after the, all the COVID spending <clears throat> and all of the government spending uh, rallying inflation, the inflation that was pretty much non-existent for, you know, a decade or more. Um, we got it pretty quickly, seems to have retreated. Um, so the clarity, you know, that the market seeks on interest rates doesn't necessarily exist. Uh, solid trend of inflation easing has, has turned murky and the Fed could be forced to raise rates again, or at least hold them higher for longer. Um, again, I mentioned the yield curve uh there's some some belief and analysis that the <clears throat> inverted yield curve isn't as great of an indicator <clears throat> excuse me of recession back in the old days um recession used to be two negative quarters of gdp uh we had that in q2 uh, in q1 and q2 of 22 um they changed those rules back during covid i still think that they're valid i I believe we had a recession back in the beginning of 22. And I think, uh, as we've seen, other countries are still of that belief. Um, so I don't see a recession coming anytime soon. I'm sure we'll get one in the future. All of the metrics for the yield curve, you know, forecasting or indicating recession were way past or way at the end of, of, of those time frames. Um, we're still seeing decent economic numbers robust GDP numbers right here. This uh, Atlanta, GD, Atlanta Fed GDP now has been extremely accurate. Um, it does get closer to the number as the month progresses. It might come down a little bit, but 5.6% um, uh, is great. Great for the economy, but it's a little hot and it does put inflationary, you know, uh, pre pressure on inflation and put some doubts on, on the Fed hikes or cuts uh, and definitely suggests higher for longer. There's still, you know, a decent amount of fear mongering out there, though the soft landing talk is picked up. Um, but we still um, we don't think there's a recession likely. And we think that these there's some cross currents, you know, uh, um, the inflation is up. The GDP is strong. Labor market's still pretty solid, but I'm getting a little tighter. <clears throat> so, um, again, this is sort of those cross currents that we think there can, can, you know, dovetail with the seasonal weakness 
and uh, put a little correction and, and more, a little more correction in the market here. Updated Fed uh, futures um, analysis. This has gone up to 92% for staying at five, um, five and a quarter to 550 for the September 20th meeting. Pretty low uh, uh, um, odds of, of a hike next next meeting at the 20th. But it went further out. Um, we've seen, you know, it's still about 50-50 for the November meeting. Um, this is ticked up a little bit for it staying the same. Um, and uh, this has come down a little bit. And then looking out at December, uh, this number popped in where the potential for a cut is a small percentage. I'm not sure that that's uh, relevant, but still 50-50 that rates will stay the same or go up a little bit, uh, even looking out towards the end of the year. So is the Fed done for now? Maybe. I don't think they know. Um, they're definitely close to the end. Uh, we've, we've had, what, five whole percentage points or, or five and a quarter uh, <clears throat> over the past year, um, year and a half. So that's um, that's quite a bit, even though we're right about nearly historical averages for, for the Fed fund rate. Um, energy prices. Um, as you can see here, um, you know, the... The chart of the this is crude oil futures um, <clears throat> has created this sort of triple or even quadruple or quintuple bottom that I've highlighted here with these red arrows. It's broken this long downtrend line. It broke it first back in March, April, and then sort of hugged it for support. And then, you know, when things changed, um, the, you know, the, the supply structure became um, limited. Uh, we saw a rally here. Um, pretty strong up through this sort of uh, April high resistance. Um, it looks like the October, November is, is you know, the next target. And I think you can go higher from there. Um, so this reduced supply situation sent prices, crude prices high. I think it's it's um, potentially going to take out that 93, 94 level October, November. Um, this is one of the reasons that we're avoiding a... Uh, seasonal short in crude oil and crude oil stocks or in oil and gas stocks, which I'll show you in a second uh, or in a few minutes. Here's the investors intelligence sentiment that we're looking at here. Um, the bulls had jumped from 49, uh, uh, 493 um, from 43 and now they're back down. Uh, so um the fewest bulls since since late late winter back back at you know the August um when we had that August top it came down or at, right here at the bottom when, when we had that little rally so we're looking at some choppy sentiment the bulls came back in after the the August rally um I think it's set up for a little bit of a a pullback here again um kind of even across there with um bulls up and uh Bears, you know, still around 22% and the correction, um, you know, still around 30%, 28%. So uh, a little bit of a correction, you know, indicated by the um, uptick in the bulls, but not a full, you know, major sell-off or bear situation uh, because there's still a decent amount of people expecting correction and, and bear market. Let's get into some of the trades. Um, so we take all this information that I've, I know it's a lot. And we put it to play in market timing with the indexes and sector rotation trades and stock picking. Um, not sure if there's any questions. No. Okay. So we have a, a, a seasonal um, a trade for biotech that started in August. We're looking to get in on a, a dip here for the for the um, IBB, the iShares Biotech, down around 123. Um, you know, we, it did hit there a little bit after we came out with this, but there's still time. We think this is a good sector for the future. It looks like there's a little consolidation here in the chart. Um, so, you know, a little buy limit of 123.50 for the, the biotech. Um, this trade runs. Um, it's, a, it's a decent sector for the worst months, um, but it usually runs for several months, and it's also a good long-term trade. The other biotech ETF is the XBI, the Spider. Uh, looking for a buy price is 77.50. Uh, again, we hit that at the August correction. We're still on our uh, buy and a dips situation. So 
having, you know, you're not having known about it back then, you can still look for it to get down below that 7750 number for getting in uh, to the XBI. Um, and these are all in the newsletter portfolio at our website. Um, and if you, you want to just kick the tires, there's a free trial you can you can check out. Um, <clears throat> you click on login and you don't have a login, it'll show you, you know, a place to fill out the info for a free trial. Um, and here, you know, I mentioned we did pick super microcomputer, um, but the, you know, semiconductor short is a, is a, is an annual seasonal trade in the, um, uh, SOX, um, and the SOXX is that sector. And this just, uh, uh got executed around, um, the 10th of August. We put this on a hold, but we had a breakdown below. Uh, 498.96, which was the support level we had. So we weren't just shorting it anytime. We wanted to break through support. And you can see the updated um, buy signals, uh, excuse me, stop losses and target prices. We're looking for a little bit lower here if we want to do an auto sell at a target price. So that's one of the recent trades, shorting the semiconductor ETF. Two more. Um, the transports and the industrials, I just put the two charts here on the page. Again, both went through on the August sell-off at August 15th. Um, transports below 252.69. The uh, XLI below 108.78. Both have been moved to hold. We've brought this on all these shorts. We brought the stock down to the entry level for break-even. And then we have a... Um, uh, a target price, uh, auto sell price, uh, an additional 10% below the, the average 15 year uh, drop, um, which you can see in the table. I think that'll be coming up. If not, it's on our website as well of what our target price is. And then there's this, this oil sector trade. This is the oil and gas sector, the XOI, you know, oil and gas index of stocks. It's, it's tracked by the XLE um, pretty closely. And also the FCG runs close with it. So the XLE is the spider um, uh, energy sector. Um, you can see that in the blue line here. The first trust natural gas stocks. Now gas has been flat. Uh, inventories are up natural, for natural gas, but all the stocks in that sector uh, also have other, you know, um, uh, uh, activities in, in oil and gas and in marketing and distribution. So, Crude oil price is really impacting the you know, first trust natural gas stocks as well because it's not pure natural gas. Um, so although uh, the oil and gas sector rallied substantially off the June lows, as you can see here, um, ahead of this seasonal short trade, we're going to pass on it because I don't like the setup tactically or fundamentally. Um, you know, you can see the average seasonal trend is for you know, the XOI to go down from June to December, September. And then there's a little short trade from September through the end of October. Um, so because of this diversion, it's not a technical diversion. It's not something we're going to get into. And then, um, you know, on the fundamental side, I don't really believe that there is any, uh, any indication that supply is going to pick up. I don't think OPEC or Russia is going to start selling lots of oil to the rest of the world. I think they're happy with prices where they are. And I don't know of any indications of demand coming down for oil and gas. So um, that's why we're passing on the uh, oil and gas sector seasonal short this time. Here's the portfolios for the ETF. Uh, updated this the other day for... Um, the ETF trades issue that went out on the 6th. Um, you can see the uh, auto sell prices I was alluding to um, that have been added. Uh, oh no, this is this is the older one. I, this is not the updated one. I, th these were the stop losses. Of, these are the old stop losses. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, we can look at it on the website if somebody wants me to pull it up in, in the Q and A. Um, and a couple of different tables I put in there. So anyway, these become the, the, the stops. We haven't executed the 
the uh, technology, the IY Delby, we're looking for a little bit more of a pullback there. Um, and uh, on the indexes, on the tactical switching strategy, um, TLT is really a half position. It's something we thought wasn't great. We got into a half position that early on at the end of the best six months. AGG and the BND, you know, the aggregate bond, the total bond index, not responding that well because people think rates are still going up. But the big, the big buy that we still like, um, even even currently, is the the short term bonds and the zero to three month bonds. So the SHV and the S SGOV are the ones that we're currently, you know, interested in. I own them myself. And then there's, of course, cash. Cash is a position. Um, but it's nice to be able to earn some interest around 5% or so uh, in these particular, um, you know, during the worst months that we haven't had for, for a long time. Um, so this is a quick snapshot of the portfolio. Uh, and... Um, We'll look at the stocks here. Just remember that we're going to have brand new stock picks coming out in October, November. Um, and here is, you know, our thinned out portfolios. Uh, cash giving us time to think here. You can see this is, you know, updated as of um, last month. We're going to put out next week will be our, our stock um, portfolio updates. Uh, there's Super Microcomputer. We purchased that at, excuse me, 8193 back in uh, November of last year, um, currently up. We sold half on a double there. That's what the little two um, is there. That's also a sold half on a double. Um, and that's up quite substantially. Excellus Technologies is also benefiting from the AI um, you know, um, craze. Um, and the large caps also thin out. 18th is something we're holding on to for the dividend. Um, something's getting ready to turn there, but that's the one blemish we have in the portfolio. Uh, and uh, United Health slightly underperforming as well. Um, AT and T is the one held without a stop loss. Uh, and then I want to just finish up with looking ahead to next year and um, give a little recap. And while I'm pausing, somebody's got a question. No, I don't recommend buying long-term bonds in the ETF environment. I recommend buying the um, short-term ones, as I just just mentioned. I think I just mentioned that. Um, so, all right, follow-up question. Why? Because we're not quite convinced that um, bonds bond rates are that the Fed's done hiking and therefore short-term bonds are going to go down because rates are still continuing to go up, whereas short-term ones are not going down. I mean, I think that the 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 performance of the long-term bond in this portfolio is indicative of why we want to be in these getting 4.3 quarters or 5% and just the the coupon, you know, the, the price holding steady, whereas um, we're getting less, you know, interest and we're losing money here. Moving right along <clears throat> to the, I uh, hope that answered your question, Bobby. For further, we can follow up afterwards. Um, still tracking the four-year cycle. I showed you this before, showing you it again, just to set up what we're looking at, you know, sideways through Q3 into October, and then rally year-end into Q1, a little sideways in the middle of next year, and then um, rallying towards the end of the year. I'm looking for roughly around uh, potentially, you know, high single-digit, low double-digit uh, gains for next year, uh, so far the early handicapping. Um, I talked about the power of a sitting president running for re-election. Um, you know, when a sitting president's running, the S&P 500 averages 12.8% since 1949 election years, uh, substantially better than when there's an open field. And the red line you see here with a, a loss of uh, 1.5%. Um, I have the aggregate cycle for 2024. That's including election years, uh, as well as fourth years of the decade. 
um, along with all years, and then the black line is all election years. Um, so, you know, the market hates uncertainty. And with the sitting president running, there's a good chance the market, economic, and civic conditions will likely remain unchanged, whereas with an open field, there are a great deal of unknowns. So 2024 has that power of incumbency going for it, regardless of, of what the policies or politics are. You've got somebody who's in control, decent chance that they'll remain in control. You're welcome, Bobby. Just looking back at the chat. Sorry. Somebody's uh, mic is on and they're making a little noise. Ray? Um... Anyway, anyway, somebody could mute him. Um, so the 2024 Stock Traders Almanac Outlook, this is something that I write you know, every year around June, <clears throat> looking, you know, 12 or you know, six to 18 months out, looking at the end of 24. Um, so we think that the current four-year cycle continues to track those patterns. Um, bullish election year performance in 24, boosted by the sitting president running for re-election, um, and probably the Dow gains somewhere in the 8 to 12 percent range. Um, S&P and NASDAQ likely greater gains, looking for weakness in the spring and summer of 24 during Q2 and Q3. And by the end of 24, I expect to be near my forecast at super boom level of 38,820. And then... Let's just recap, and then I'll tell you about the service a little bit. So September, October, phobia, headwinds, recession fears, even though I'm not one of them, the rising tenure yields, geopolitics, war, China, emerging markets, the inflation is done cooling, the Fed may not be done hiking, but they may also just be higher for longer. Energy prices, small caps are a little bit weaker. We've got some weakness overseas. Still got another potential government shutdown. Uh, I think they'll probably avoid that as well. And the dollar strength, um, a little bit difficult uh, for U.S. equities in the short term, at least, unless it persists. Bull market in tech stocks, unemployment remains firm, continued growth in GDP, consumer confidence still okay. Government spending is still robust. Um, I know there's a big deficit and debt issue, but they're still spending a lot of money. Um, we're tracking the cycles and pre-election year forces are in play. Fears picked up a little bit. We're seeing those market jitters here in September. You've got the institutions getting ready to do some window dressing and portfolio restructuring. Um, typical September, best months are approaching. So I think the week is going to be temporary, probably five to 10% on the correction side, give or take a little bit. Sets up a solid MACD buy for the best months. Q4 rally sends us near new highs. Best case still in play. The Fed is shifting towards neutral. Recession avoided. Still robust growth. Employment is going to remain stable. And then average pre-election year gains over 15 to 20%. And then next year, sitting president bullish for, for 2024. So that's the applied wisdom. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the service, our newsletter. It's for fund managers, advisors, and individual investors. I told you that those who understand market history are bound to profit from it. We've been the authority in seasonal market performance for five or for 57 years, straddling seven different decades from the 60s to the 2020s, a pack with lots of trading ideas and applied wisdom. Um, we use historical patterns in conjunction with market seasonality and fundamentals, technical analysis, Helps us make better trades and investments. Um, these patterns happen year after year. We think you need to know them and how we show you how to capitalize them on them. We tell you what to buy, when to buy, at what price, when to sell. Um, it's pretty simple. We send it all right to your inbox with buy limits, stop losses, um, and target prices for, for several of them, and also when to sell. Uh, you get our por portfolio up about 600% versus the um, 266 for the S&P. That's going back to 01. You get the annual stock traders almanac for free. You get our best six months buy signals, our calendar, monthly calendar and vital stats, updated analysis, 
seasonal trading strategies, the market at a glance, the pulse of the market, sector rotation trades for the seasonal sectors, and of course, our undervalued off the radar stock picks. So understanding market history can produce some gains like these. These are some of our highlights. This was the crude, the, the crude short that worked well last time. Um, QQQs, the XLK trade previously, that's one that's coming around as well. IYW as well. A couple of big highlights in the stocks. I mentioned Super Microcomputer, um, uh, Avid and Excellus, and Consumer Bank Corp. Um, here's just a longer term chart. So if you you know you don't want to miss out on our upcoming timing calls um, and our new stock baskets coming out next month and in November. Here's just a look at our daily perform our, our um, quarterly performance numbers for our investor um, almanac investor stock portfolio versus the Dow and S and P. Um, you can see we're doing much better, and um, so I hope you'll decide to join the service. You'll get um, all these benefits, the January indicators I mentioned, the best month buy and sell signals, our free lunch stocks. I didn't, I didn't talk about that's bargain stocks at year end, special situations, and access to my tools, my proprietary tools. And then we do a monthly market call with subscribers. Uh, and again, if you, know, you wanted to find out more about how we pick stocks, um, you can reach out to us individually. I always leave ample time with, for Q&A, which we're going to do right now in a moment. Uh, so get your questions ready. And here's the deal. If you want to join us, um, join the service right now. I can send you the 23 Almanac if you don't have it. And the 24 when it comes out in mid-October. Should get them to subscribers before Thanksgiving. Um, it's incredibly cheap. I think this QR code should work if, you, if you're a smartphone person. Otherwise, just go to stock traders almanac, almanac and you can plug in these two codes for a one year it's only 179 dollars <throat> it's regularly 69 dollars a quarter um for two years it's 299 you got this code right here it's pretty much you know more than half off uh and if you can't make 300 bucks on one of our trades you probably shouldn't be in the market um always includes the free almanac if you're a subscriber so this book has been on the desk of top money managers for seven decades. And um, if you don't want to miss out on all of our stock picks and market timing calls and sector trades, give us a try. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. Um, now we can get into some more questions and I can go back to some certain any slides if people want to. I want to hear about if people want me to go back and refer to things. You had answered most of the questions already in the chat, right? I don't. I believe so. Any good books? The Stock Traders Almanac, Super Boom. Um, depends upon what you're into. Uh, I mean, I like some technical books. Um, you know, there's there's books that come out every year. Um, what kind of books are you looking for? Just overall investment books? You're welcome. I don't know. Send me a note on that. I'd have to, uh, on fundamental analysis. So you got to go back to, you know, uh, McGee, um, uh, Graham and Dodd. Um, you know, there's a couple others out there. Um, I mean, fundamental analysis. Shoot me a note. Let me, I'll come up with a book. I'll come up with something for you. It's, I'm, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank right now. If I was at my, uh, you know, office in White Plains, I could look over my shoulder at the books on my shelf and probably re remember one. Um, Justin Mammoth comes to mind, you know, when to sell, but it's a little more technical. Are you talking, Lynn? You're welcome, Bobby. And again, I'm approachable if you want to, Send an email or call the number if I don't pick up or somebody doesn't pick up. We can uh, get back to you. If anyone wishes to save the chat, if you just uh, click on the three dots at the bottom of chat and then click save, it'll save the uh, chats for today. Um, 
Yeah. So, fine. Lynn, did you have any questions? I mean, we'll give people a couple of minutes to think of something. If not, and I answered everything, then great. Um, I have an early flight tomorrow. Okay. Well, thanks very much for presenting to us. That was uh, very interesting. And you do cover this, the seasonality and the presidential cycle in a, uh, really one of the best presenters, in, in, in particularly in those cycles. And we appreciate that. Thank you, sir. If anybody else has a question, go ahead and uh, and do it. Over. Um, yeah, there's one about individual bills or bonds. I don't necessarily gravitate towards individual stocks, uh, you know, corporate bonds or individual bonds. But you know, the the was it the I bond site seems to be a good place to go. Um, but uh, you know, that that's something that's you're probably better off with um, your advisor that that has. Uh, you know, access to that stuff. I, I, I'm more of a fan of the ETFs. I don't think there's a need for individual investors, you know, who tra trade their own account to, to go pick individual bonds. That's something you want to do through a, an account, in my view. Treasury Direct can be a good option, but if you that's, end that's up the one. The, Thank you. Thank you. But I if you end up bonds, the, but, yeah, if you end up in the penalty box, it can take you months to get your account online. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You know, um, that was a good couple hours we ran for. I appreciate you having me. Uh, it always It's always good to um, take the time to go through and reorganize everything and try to present it fresh to people and, and go back and go through things. So I always learn myself when I put these things together. Oh, well, we appreciate it. Uh, again, a reminder, the... Uh, 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 you know, it takes us about a week to process the uh, video and to get it on YouTube. So you'll get a notice if you uh, registered for this uh, so you can get access to the uh, meeting and, and play it back. Because there's a lot, of a lot of information contained in this presentation. So, Jeff, thank you very much. And thanks to all those that helped put on this uh, webinar today. Uh, it takes a, a team to, to make it all happen. And uh, so we appreciate all that help. Uh, so uh, I wish everybody a, a good week and a good month. And we'll be back in a month with our uh, estate planning program. So thank you. Thank you.